Greetings, Delta Chi. My name is Peter Lane. I'm the Director of Development for the Delta Chi Educational Foundation, coming to you from my home office here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm excited to introduce our speakers for this year's international chapter meeting. But before I do, let me tell you about our format. This is the next evolution of the international chapter call, and this video will be streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and the Delta Chi website at deltachi.org. Tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be joined by each one of the speakers for a live question and answer session, and we hope that you will tune in and bring your questions for our leaders to answer. We're gonna be joined by 53rd AA International President, Aaron Otto of the Kansas State Chapter, graduate 1998. We're also gonna be joined by the Delta Chi Educational Foundation Chairman of the Board, Rod Arnold of the Texas A&M Chapter, graduate 1988. And then finally, we're gonna hear from the top professional, Delta Chi Fraternity's Executive Director, Jared Bright of the Central Missouri Chapter, graduate 2004. Each of them are gonna tell you a little bit about the year in review, some challenges we're facing, and the exciting things we all have to look forward to in the future. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for all you do to advance Delta Chi. Hello, welcome, thanks for joining us. My name is Aaron Otto, and I've been pleased to serve as your international president or AA from 2016 to 2020. And I'm here today to visit a little bit about some of the progress that's been made here in the last year of 2019. I'll tell you from the beginning that the current status of Delta Chi is strong and the future looks very promising. We have 112 chapters and, and colonies and 35 alumni chapters. Unfortunately, we lost a few chapters in 2019, four of them for conduct and a couple closing for size. Currently, we have 12 colonies uh, that are mostly on sites of places of former chapters, but some new expansions as well. Virginia Tech, Chico, Central Oklahoma, Colorado State, San Antonio, University of Nebraska Omaha, University of Alaska Anchorage, North Carolina Chapel Hill, and the University of Denver. This spring, we're also very excited to go back to three former chapter sites at Washington University, Creighton University, and San Diego State. This last year, we were also able to charter four different groups. We were able to charter Southern Illinois Edwardsville, Delaware, Kent State, and UNLV, and then we look forward to up to seven charterings in 2020. And looking back at the last year, there are a few facts I'm particularly proud of, and I would like to highlight those for you now. The first is growth. In 2019, we shared our brotherhood with over 5,000 undergrads, and that is a dramatic improvement over where we've been in the past in terms of number of members. We welcome new fraternity staff like Director Bright, our executive director, who started on January 1st, and he's been building out the rest of the staff. We also look, we welcomed a new member of the Board of Regents, Ben Dundas joined from South Florida, representing Region 8. And in 2020, we'll thank Justin Donnelly from Kent State for his six years of service on the Board of Regents. We've seen a number of alumni chapters start. We're now up to 35, including Philadelphia, Chicago, Memphis, all added in 2019. We look at these as ways for people to be able to stay involved and have that lifelong commitment in Delta Chi and that relationship with the fraternity. But the area I want to focus on a little bit is strategic initiatives and the strategic plan 2.0. There's many years of efforts went into building this plan. And over the last five years, we put in a number of very measurable objective objectives and goals for the strategic initiative. If you'd like more information about this, you can see the Delta Chi website at deltachi.org SI 2021. But I'd like to highlight a couple of those and I'll do that here shortly. The one other I'm very proud of is housing. In 2019, the fraternity invested almost $600,000 in Barrister Capital Corporation which provides management and in some cases ownership of Delta Chi chapter houses like Central Missouri, Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois Carbondale, Missouri, uh, Oshkosh, and Illinois State. We're also happy that the fraternity was able to loan just over $2 million to Miami's chapter for a complete renovation of their chapter property. I will tell you, Delta Chi does care a lot about our members' experiences from the first day as their associate member all the way through their many years as alumnus. These objectives is what's helped us build out of our preamble and build the strategic initiatives. We believe these initiatives will help build a bigger, better Delta Chi in the future. Just to highlight a couple of the areas of strategic planning that we've been working on the last few years. One is alumni engagement. For the third year, we'll have an alumni training track at the regional leadership conferences offered this spring. We hope to see a number of you there. Please see the website for where the regional leadership conference is gonna be held nearest you. In addition, we also added five alumni chapters, as I mentioned earlier and we've seen a lot of new resources being available for EE and alumni chapters being built. 
Education, this is an area I'm particularly proud of. We've piloted after many years, looking at an alumni uh, associate member program. And in that program, we found the results that we're seeing over a 90% retention rate of chapters, AMs that are using that program. Growth is another area. We were able to open up a number of new colonies, which you heard me talk about earlier. And our executive director, we originally had set a goal of having five new colonies every year. He's striving to have six going forward and has been able to meet that this last year. So we're on track to see us reach 120 chapters by the end of 2021 at the rate we're expanding. And then civic responsibility, that's a great place where the V Foundation effort starts. Our undergraduates have done a great job raising several hundred thousand dollars each two years. Whereas when we started this initiative in 2006, 2008, we were excited about raising hundred thousand dollars. And now we're surpassing that by many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's in addition to the local dollars that are given to charities and worthwhile causes in the communities that host our fraternity groups. And like I said, each of these are very measurable and specific, and we'll have a celebration of kind of the conclusion of SI 2.0 at the St. Louis Convention, which reminds me, I look forward to seeing a number of you from July 29th to August 2nd, St. Louis. We haven't been there since 1998, and we're looking at this being the biggest convention we've ever had. Our previous convention record is 624 at Denver, set in 2018, and based on the location of chapters, I think we are in well conditioned with your help to surpass that number. Um, we need every group to be looking at sending five or more delegates and certainly want a strong alumni presence to join us, especially over the weekend in St. Louis. And I'll tell you, as a volunteer, I've had a chance to travel around over 100 different chapters and colonies, and I hear numerous questions about how to be involved. And I want to tell you, in addition to your, to your dollars and financial support, probably even is equally important is the non-monetary ways you can be involved in the fraternity. The best thing you can do and one of the most valuable things you can do for us is give your time to make us a better organization. Volunteering at the regional, local, or international levels is critical, but particularly at the local level to help guide our members to serve as mentors on the ground as they're operating our fraternity chapters. Because I still believe, as when I said for when I ran for AA the first time, that when fraternity is done right, we are a force for change and making a positive change in an individual's life. And I want to thank you for everything you do to live out our values every day and making Delta Chi the best fraternity in your campus and community. And I really look forward to your questions soon. Have a good day. Now we're gonna hear from the Delta Chi Educational Foundation Chairman of the Board, Rod Arnold. Hi everybody, Rod Arnold. I'm honored to serve as the Chairman of the Delta Chi Educational Foundation Board and look forward to our international chapter call this Wednesday evening. Prior to the call, they had asked me to talk about a few things, recap the year, talk about some of the challenges that we have on this side of the organization, some of the future goals and an overall vision. So I wanted to touch on some of that before we get into the call later this week. Number one, I wanna thank the donors. 2019 was a banner year for the foundation and the brotherhood. For the first time in a very long time, donations in 2019 actually topped those of 2018, a convention year. First time in a very long time that that had happened. Another thing that happened was our Founders Day of Giving. I want to thank everybody for that. Donations were up 37% with Peter and Jason broadcasting live from the top of the knoll at Cornell. That was wonderful. Number of unique donors are up. It's actually the second highest year we've ever had. We had 842 unique brothers donating to the foundation this year. Thank you very much. The highest was 909, by the way, in 2015, and that's when there was a major push to launch the 1890 Society with our undergraduate brothers. Trustee Societies. <clears throat> Trustee Society are donors who are giving recurring gifts annually of a minimum of $1,000 to the general fund and the foundation. Thank you so much. We're now up to triple digits of members of the Trustee Society. Our top three donor states this year were Florida number one, uh, my home state of Texas was number two, and Georgia, where I live now, was number three. So congratulations, Texas, moving up a spot from 2018. People were asking about challenges uh, that we face and, and some of the things that we discuss around the board table. And I made some notes on that. The, the number one thing uh, that we face all the time is trying to balance current needs and requests and grant requests of the fraternity staff with long-term needs of the foundation and the brotherhood. And that's, I think, what we spend a lot, most of our time about. And, and the, the notes that I had on that is, is really what we focus on is, is making very solid, grounded business decisions 
um, while helping to meet all of the programming needs uh, and grant requests of the fraternity staff and the chapters. A lot of people think of the foundation of their donation, and there are different types of donations. Some of them are very specific for the chapter needs or for certain types of programming. Um, so those are the types of things that we, we talk about quite a bit is trying to balance the long-term uh, goals of the fraternity versus the immediate needs on that. Some of the steps that we've, that we've taken in that regard is, number one, as I mentioned, a very smart, realistic budget, operational budget based on uh, historical data, um, not wish lists. We, we all have our favorite thing that we would like to see for the fraternity, uh, but we have to make a very, very realistic operational budget. So we, don't, we, uh, we try not to make promises uh, that we can't keep in that regard. <clears throat> Another thing that we've done is a board recruitment process that we've implemented over the last number of years. It has absolutely transformed the foundation board. I work with the absolute best group of men you could possibly imagine. It is exciting when we get together. Um, we bander about the issues. Uh, we don't always agree on everything, which I think is a, a great thing because I think the decisions that come out of it uh, tend to be better decisions. Um, and we based it on um, you've always heard about time, talent, and treasure. Well, we've inverted that a little bit. We recruit talent pools first. So again, the experience levels and the variety of skill sets of the men sitting around the table of the foundation, I think is the best it's ever been. And I may be biased in that regard, but I've known a lot of uh, the guys that have served on it for a long, long time, and it just keeps getting better and better. So you should feel very good about that. Um, talents come first, time comes next, as far as how much time they can donate. And I'm always appreciative of the time that, that men take to serve on our meetings, on our teleconferences. We have teleconferences uh, monthly. Uh, we have board calls and executive committee calls. So thank you to all the men that serve on both of those. In addition to the committees that we have uh, serving on specific needs for the foundation. Um, and then treasure is last. I don't know if everyone understands or knows this. Uh, I think most people do. But did you know that all board members um, are expected to be trustee society members. And uh, the trustee society members, again, are donating $1,000 uh, to unrestricted and unrestricted funds to the general fund above and beyond any pet projects or chapter initiatives that they're, that they're funding as well. So everyone that sits on the board annually donates a minimum of $1,000 to the general fund for use in programming and operations for the fraternity and the foundation. Um, another thing, steps that we're taking is to decrease our dependence on a literal handful of benefactors. So um, we have all seen uh, the brethren who have been extremely generous over the years, but our goal is to really expand our alumni base as rapidly as we can uh, and have some fun doing it. So I think a number of people have heard about the Army of Donors initiative that our development staff has been working on over the last couple of years. And I'll run that down for you. There's some pretty easy math on it that can help people understand. So the Army of Donors is, is all about expanding our alumni base as rapidly uh, as possible. And uh, that, in, that constitutes 250 trustee society members at $1,000 uh, a year uh, recurring to the general fund. After that, um, 1,000 donors, and I'm looking at some notes here, 1,000 donors giving $20 a month recurring. And then after that, 600 student donors giving just $18.90 annually as a member of the 1890 Society. So 250 trustee members, 1,000 donors giving just $20 a month, and 600 student donors adds up to $500,000 a year towards our general fund. So everyone has a place in regards to donations uh, and giving to the foundation. Um, and that's where we get a very, very realistic operational budget that can not only uh, handle operations, but also literally all the programming needs uh, that we could possibly um, desire uh, on the fraternity side. So that's what we're pushing for as soon as possible. It's balancing the current needs with the long-term needs as well. Another initiative that the development staff has been working on is a relaunch of the Heritage Society. Now, some people know about the Heritage Society, but it's basically the planned giving uh, element for estates uh, as brothers pass on to that higher court. And we're looking for uh, and seeking a goal of a million dollars in documented planned giving by the end of 2020. Uh, 100 brothers uh, at, uh, at $10,000 gifts per person would get us there or some variation thereof. So we've got the army of donors, we've got a heritage society relaunch that we're working on to try to balance some of those challenges that we're, that we're facing in regards to relying on uh, a handful of very benevolent brothers for a lot of the programming needs. So we're working on that diligently and the development staff has been doing a great job on that. Overall, we're looking at increased donor alumni engagement in 2019. We had 40 plus events across the country 
dinners, um, golf tournaments, um, our uh, uh, board meetings, our winter board meetings were held in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we invited uh, a very large uh, regional donor pool there to come and, and visit with us for the evening and camaraderie uh, and build relationships, and it went extremely well. Another interesting point about that I was very proud of is at the end of the winter board meetings, we had a little bit of a pass the hat with the donors and the brothers that were there. And just in regards to keeping uh, you know, tabs and uh, everything frugal on the operation side, all of the brothers that serve on the foundation board donate their time and their treasure and their uh, talents to come to the board meetings. So whenever we have board meetings, all the brothers that are attending are paying their own way except for our paid staff. At the end of the Florida meetings, we had to pass the hat and basically raise the funds to pay for the meeting space and the meals and everything that we had. So none of that came out of the operations budget of the foundation, which we were very happy. I was very happy with, and I know everyone was proud of that. So as, as far as future goals, um, it's important to think about it in three parts. Um, I use the, the, the uh, uh, goals, objectives, and directives. So the goals are our individual goals that we have, and those are eliminating um, uh, the mentality of, of a startup foundation that all foundations go through, which is we bring money in and we have needs and we spend the money and then we start over from a virtual zero every year. So we're working very hard. We've been working for years and we're very progressively, very positively moving uh, towards the model of being a sustained, sustained foundation where we're not having to start from zero every year. Um, minimize the burn rate. Um, in a startup business, I think um, some people understand that terminology, but basically when you, when you have your investment at the beginning of the year, you want to make sure and be very frugal uh, in your spending and, your, and your, uh, your outlays. And we work on that on the foundation as well. Again, keep in mind a lot of the dollars that sit in the foundation are restricted dollars, meaning people giving to chapter scholarship accounts, um, EKI accounts, educational chapter housing initiative uh, accounts. So those dollars sit there for future needs. Uh, but can't be touched and cannot be used for operations. So uh, the objectives that we have, the objectives can be defined as what the fraternity uh, staff is requesting in the form of grants uh, that, that to help, you know, for the foundation to help with. So those would be leadership programs like our A's Academy, um, uh, Emerging Leaders Academy, um, RLCs now, uh, I believe are on the docket coming up in regards to requests. Uh, for leadership training. Those are all very, very worthwhile programs that we endeavor to cover as much as we can. And, and my personal goal uh, long term would be to cover those 100%. In order to get there, we've got to minimize the burn rate, which means we have to start thinking long term. Um, and we, we have done that in regards to the initiation of tools and uh, buckets that we did not have before. So I think most people know, but the foundation finally uh, agreed on language a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, to establish the endowment fund. Now we're not actively marketing the endowment fund, but now we have the vehicle because we have brothers that give in different ways. There's basically three lanes of giving. Some people like to see their dollars work right now. They like to see it in programming and see it work. And that's a perfect example of that is when people make donations to the A's Academy. Other people like to see their dollars go straight to the chapter. Maybe they were, um, maybe they didn't attend RLCs or go to conventions, but they were very uh, involved in their chapter and they give generously to their chapter into an EKI account or a chapter scholarship account. Other people like the idea of the true uh, word, the traditional word of the foundation, which is to put the money there and it's there forever and it throws off all, uh, other dollars to help fund programming. So that's what the endowment account is all about. We are, we are very slowly building that with very specific uh, special gifts. It is not part of the operational budget at this time, uh, but we have the vehicle there um, so we can accept transformational gifts. And that's some of the marketing that our development staff is doing with other donors and donor cultivation. So those are the things that we're working on. So we've got goals, objectives, directives. The directives um, come from you, the donor, and it goes back to that three lanes of giving. Donors share with us what they would like done with their money, and it is their money. So that's the one area where we can't control, but we can be ready uh, and available to receive those generous gifts from donors. So that's what we're working on in 2020. Uh, I'm very excited about all those. Um, again, the vision long term for me would be for Delta Chi to be a premier co uh, collegiate leadership training course available, a resource for young men to join. Um, I believe strongly in the fraternity system, um, a, a true foundation entity. Um, with primary programs and operations funded in perpetuity, 
And bottom line, uh, I have three young sons uh, that are coming into their teenage years. Uh, I want a fraternity where it's going to be a very safe, positive environment for them, where they can get good leadership training, enjoy the camaraderie, uh, and enjoy my fraternity, my brotherhood uh, with me. Uh, and I think that drives everything that I do in regards to um, service to the foundation and the fraternity is making sure that we, uh, we have this organization around in a very positive light, a very positive sense for future generations. Very proud of this brotherhood. I'm very proud of you, uh, the donors and the brothers that are involved, and all the volunteers uh, in all different areas of the enterprise. Uh, great group of, of men, and I'm, I'm proud to be a Delta Chi. Look forward to talking to everyone soon. Thank you for your comments, Aaron and Rod. Now we're going to hear from the top professional, Delta Chi Executive Director, Jared Bright. Twenty nineteen was a great year for Delta Chi. The accomplishments we achieved put the organization in a position to further advance progress on the strategic initiatives and really assess the needs of chapters and members evaluate, and then provide tailored and consistent services based on those needs. In 2019, we relocated the international headquarters to Indianapolis, Indiana from Iowa City, Iowa. While our history for 314 Church Street will always be a part of our legacy, our new headquarters is over 10,000 square feet and includes a library, training space, and our fraternity's first history museum. We're fortunate to have added to our amazing team of industry professionals in 2019. Brother Aaron Wilson, Kansas O2, was hired as the Associate Executive Director. Heather Lockwood was promoted to the Senior Director of Field Operations. Brother Davis Miller, Kansas 16, was hired as the Director of Member Safety. Brother Devante Hamilton, Ferrum 16, promoted to the Director of Fraternity Growth. Brother J.C. McGeary, Colorado State 18, was promoted from Senior Leadership Consultant to the membership and billing leader, a position formerly held by longtime administrator, Deborah Bilskimper. James Ratliff was hired as the director of finance in 2019, replacing longtime accounting administrator, Annie Schulte. Jamlin, brother from Florida State 2015, was hired as the director of fraternity services. In 2019 also brought to our staff five amazing brothers to serve as leadership consultants. Brothers Brennan Wiley from Missouri State, Carter Lukes from Eastern Illinois, Jordan Thatch from Little Rock, Kelby Schultz from Iowa State, Chisholm from Mississippi State. This group of dedicated and committed professionals are outstanding servants to our brotherhood. In 2019, some of the longest employees transitioned out of working for the fraternity headquarters, Deborah Bilskemper, Annie Schulte, and Claudia Jansenius. While we were sad to see them leave, we are so grateful for their decades of service to the fraternity, and we're very lucky to still be in touch with them today. The Thai fraternity continues to see positive strides in a very competitive and culture challenging time. We continue to see growth by achieving invitations to expand ahead of larger organizations, placing Delta Chi in a more sought after position. Our strategic goal was to achieve five new expansion projects each year, and in 2020, I'm proud to say we'll see that goal with six new expansions. We're proud of the hard work by the brothers at all of the seven colonies set to charter in 2020. Yes, seven are set to charter in 2020. 15 other fraternities expanded to the same institutions with a total of 18 expansions as Delta Chi within the past three years. Three of 19 expansions failed, where Delta Chi did not. Here's how we compare. Our average GPA increased one again to 3.09, while theirs is a 2.93. Our average father size increased again to 38, theirs 27. Our average colony retention is 94% and theirs 79%. In 2019, we focused on adding resources like the revised briefs and adding new in-person and remote training and education for the C and D. Our four, six, or eight week associate member program for the second year yielded a retention rate of over 90% for those using it over those who are not. I'm also proud to announce that in 2019, the fraternity received the 2019 Outstanding Educational Program by the Association of Fraternity and Sorority Advisors. 
We're all very proud of that program and think you should be as well. In 2019, the community saw a 47% decrease in chapters on corrective action from 2018. We're all proud of the focus and sincerity brought to the table by our chapters and colonies for change. While this shows great progress and the beginning of a true shift in the way we practice being our brother's keeper, we hope it will also begin to have a positive impact on insurance premiums. But changing culture effectively takes time and any claim paid out this year will affect us for the next five. In 2019, we also did a few previously not done before. We hosted town halls for alumni and undergraduate brothers in each region to hear directly about the risk management policy. We also conducted a survey of alumni and undergraduates to solicit opinions, gain better knowledge, and include brotherhood in building the next strategic plan. We added new officer onboarding through an online learning management system and added tailored officer tracks at the RLC for the C&D. Providing more webinars by Delta Chi's for Delta Chi's on topics like mental health and substance abuse, helping your brothers in need. In 2019, we were spending in many areas of the operation. We eliminated waste and consolidated programs and platforms saving the fraternity money. We did this without reducing essential services. In fact, we increased services by focusing on providing those services in a manner more desired by our undergraduates on a consistent basis. We focused on using our expansions as a home base, allowing leadership consultants to recruit on site while working remotely with their chapters and colonies, then evaluate needs based on assessment data and determine which chapters needed tailored specific assistance. Today, the fraternity staff is made up of 18 quality individuals who serve more than 45, mem 45 members and over 500 alumni volunteers. And they do so in an age of online instant communication. Our commitments are the same, to do all of it and more, faster, and same level of equity and attention. But one person can only do so much which is why our partnership with alumni advisors is more important now than ever. I could go on and on and on, but I'm truly excited to be seen as the executive director of the Delta Chi International Fraternity. And together with a strong and engaged alumni base, outstanding professional fraternity staff and a dedicated, committed group of undergraduate brothers will remain steadfast in our objectives for growth, alumni engagement, education and civic responsibility. But we cannot do this alone. We can't do it without your help. No matter the amount of time you can give, your talents and experiences are essential to the success of our chapters. If you have even one hour a week, there is a place for you. You can email me directly at jbreit at deltachi.org. We can help find that place for you. So you can give back to that which we know gave so much to you. Thank you.